I'll come on to uh, been, having been to one of our meetings before West Wales. Um, you know, where a branch has been in uh, being since uh, 2000. We started off as a district, moved into a branch oh, back in the late 2000s. Um, and since then, we've gone strength to strength. Uh, West Wales itself, you know, beautiful part of the world. That's why we live down here. Uh, but over the next number of years, um, it's planned that West Wales will become, as they call it now, the kingdom of, of energy, where we'll be producing, they reckon a third of the UK's energy, with wind farms and other items which are being looked at. Uh, with regard to this evening's uh, events, um, I'd like to welcome Sean Slaymaker, who uh, wor worked for Mid and West Wales Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, Sean will go through his own uh, background in a moment. Um, he's going to talk this evening about fire service remote uh, inspections. Uh, <clears throat> I say Sean is, is the head of business fire safety with uh, Mid and West Wales Fire and Rescue Services. Uh, so he's going to talk about remote inspections. Could I all ask with regard to Zoom itself, um, if you've got any questions on the way through the evening when Sean's undertaking his presentation, could you please put them into the chat um, and I will pick them up at the end. And at the end, I will also open up to any questions that people may have. Um, with that, I'm not going to um, hold the presentation up. I'm going to hand over to Sean Slaymaker now to introduce himself and start tonight's proceedings. Good evening, Sean, and welcome. Thank you, Seamus. Okay, if you bear with me a minute while I share the screen here. Okay, has that shared? Not yet, Sean. <clears throat> Should we drop it in there? I was saying never works like when we No, it doesn't, does it? Okay, we'll move doing something now. There we are. That's, that's right, Sean. We're that, that's something you, now. You've got there. Just need to put on the presentation mode. Yeah, brilliant. That's the one. Are we away? Yes, yep. we are. Okay, apologies for that. So um, good evening, everybody, and thanks for uh, the invite to present to you tonight. So my name's um, Sean Slaymaker. I work for Mid and West Wales Fire and Rescue Service, and uh, specifically in the Business Fire Safety Department, or if anybody's joining us from England or further afield, quite often called the prote protection part of um, Fire and Rescue Services. So I've been with the service for uh, just over 23 years, uh, albeit only um, some 18 months as head of the fire safety department. Um, I guess it's been a strange old uh, couple of years that we've had to endure um, and some of the sort of key areas of work that we're involved with have changed dramatically because of some um, in some instances, quite tragic uh, drivers, you know, one of the big ones being the Grenfell Tower tragedy, and more recently, the result to the pandemic. Um, so I'm going to talk this afternoon about some of the ways that we've uh, addressed our normal auditing programs, so the way that we inspect um, commercial premises as a result of some of these changes. Um, I'll start off by giving you a bit of an overview of the service, our business fire safety department, and some of the challenges that we faced uh, relating to the pandemic. I'll talk then about the concept of remote video inspection, which in itself I don't think is that innovative, um, albeit it is for us as a fire and rescue service within the UK. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about some of the feedback that we've received as um, as, as the uh, remote video inspection or the RVIs have been rolled out and some of the challenges that we've identified. So to give you an idea of uh, what the service area looks like, so the map on the right there is obviously um, a map of Wales, uh, and you can see that the Mid and West Wales Fire and Rescue Service area covers, it's four and a half thousand square miles, but it, it takes in two thirds of the landmass of Wales. 
Um, as it says there, there's about 440,000 households and just over a million people in terms of population. In terms of the way that we service that as a fire and rescue service, we've got 58 fire stations across that region and they're illustrated there on that map. And we've got just over uh, 1300 employees who uh, resource the fire service. But I suppose our resourcing model is quite different to many other public um, service organizations. So of those 1350, we've got 400 whole time or full time firefighters and, and that's their main job. That's in most cases their only job. Um, but we've also got, which is quite unique, a model of on-call firefighters, uh, firefighters who uh, quite often work extremely lengthy periods on call for the service, you know, up to 24 hours a day, seven days a week in some instances. Um, and we've got 720 of those individuals who provide that for us. We've then got about 25 fire control operators who are based in um, Bridgend in South Wales and we've got 220 support staff who provide those essential services to make sure that the service can operate. So the, there's a number of support departments within uh, the service, you know, we've got your community safety department, corporate risk, uh, people and organizational development. But the department that I head up is the business fire safety department. Uh, and we've got a team of 35 inspecting officers who enforce the regulatory reform fire safety order. So that's the bit of legislation that relates to um, commercial premises. Uh, it's a piece of legislation that has been in place for quite some time now, since 2005. And in terms of what that looks like for us within Mid and West Wales, um, it's 42,000 non-domestic premises, but not all of those make it onto our risk-based in inspection programme, but there are about 36,000 uh, properties that we uh, will inspect over a given period. So. The risk-based inspection program that I spoke about, that's a, a model that we derive from a software system that we've got. Uh, it also takes into account um, some specific priorities that we may want to deal with at the time. And of course, high-rise residential buildings would be an example of one of those specific priorities that we've currently got. And we draw upon local knowledge as well to determine what our inspection program will look like. However, typically this would involve um, hospitals, high-rise residentials, as I mentioned, um, care homes, schools, sleeping accommodation, so your hotels and guest houses, um, specialised housing such as sheltered housing and hostels and then places of major entertainment or assembly buildings where you'd expect a lot of people to gather. So that's sort of the um, the, 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 the scope and, and size of what we deliver as a fire safety department. The officers themselves, so they're trained to a level four diploma standard, which takes a minimum of two years for them to achieve that. Uh, and once they've achieved that standard, they are then able to not only inspect complex premises, but also to enforce the provisions of the regulatory reform order. And we've also got a building regulations team um, who will um, work on building regulations consultations uh, to determine the um, fire strategy, the fire methodology within the new built environment. So the size of what we do, I suppose, with that team of 35 is that we'll undertake about 1200 planned audits a year, and they are generally derived from our risk-based inspection programs, so those high risk type of premises that I just talked about but they'll also react to fire safety complaints. So we have about 300 fire safety complaints a year. They generally originate from members of the public who've been staying somewhere or are in a commercial environment where they will uh, see something that they just feel isn't quite right about the fire safety arrangements. In terms of the building regulations consultations, they run at about 1100 a year. Um, and we've got a small team um, who are trained to a higher level who deal with the building regulations consultations. Um, although we are seeing an increase in the number of consultations as a result, I suppose, of uh, in increased uh, number of, um, of developments going on in the built in environment generally. We also take, uh, undertake business engagement activities. So there's 800 business engagement activities in a year, and I can probably add another one after tonight. And finally, I suppose the, the other thing to note is that all of those 35 inspecting officers, they are uniformed officers, so that it's a single tier entry scheme. So everybody started as a firefighter. So they maintain those operational competencies so that we have operational resilience within the service. 
uh, alongside their inspecting roles. And that's never been more important than during COVID, where you know staff shortages is uh, was 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 something that affected many many sectors, and indeed it continues to do so. And we've utilised quite a few of our officers to support operational resilience to make sure that we can crew some of our stations. So when COVID came along, um, I know we all changed the way that we, we work. And there was generally from the first lockdown period between March and September, there was a, a, a complete suspension of the face-to-face -face audit programme. So generally, or historically, we've made an appointment to go and meet with people uh, at their commercial premises, and we will undertake a face-to-face -face visit, uh, do an inspection, a sample check of that premises. However, as I mentioned, that was suspended during the first period of lockdown. And from March to September, um, the department undertook desktop audits where they reviewed fire risk assessments, uh, evacuation strategies, uh, and any other um, fire safety relevant documents. The team also undertook some project work and you know some of that stuff that we'd always been too busy to do, uh, but we still engaged in reactive work. So where fire safety complaints came in, or indeed where there were fires in commercial premises, they would still follow up with a face-to-face visit under a risk-based approach. And we also undertook a lot of business engagement at that time in terms of uh, providing advice to people on how they could reopen their businesses safely once that period of lockdown came to an end. And that really continued until um, September when uh, it became quite apparent um, that you know, we were coming out of that first period of lockdown. So we sort of resumed some of the physical audits uh, in September and we did that under a very uh, risk-based approach. So we looked at where we considered to be the safest place for our inspectors to go to, where it would minimize contact with members of the public and limit um, the risk of transmission. So between September and the fire break that we had in Wales, we undertook audits in high rise residential buildings, just in the communal areas, because that's the only place that our legislation uh, has, has a bite on. And also we went to um, sleeping accommodation, so hotels and guest houses who were starting to take people back into those types of premises anyway, so it was fitting that we would address those. However, then the fire break came uh, and we went back to the desktop audits only, and I suppose that's when the first element of concern was was raised in my mind about how long are we going to be going in and out of these periods of lockdown? How long would we be restricted from visiting some of those highest risk premises in terms of fire safety? So your hospitals, residential care homes, sheltered housing schemes and schools. And, you know, there was a real challenge in terms of how to address the fire safety regulation in those uh, highest risk premises. You'll have to bear with me for the next slide. There is a reason behind it. So this was my sort of eureka moment, if you like. Um, during the period of the first lockdown, uh, we had builders at my home uh, and we were, in, we were building an extension. And I was in touch with the local building control officer uh, because I'd never undertaken work of this type before. And I said, well, how will you visit the site? How will you sign elements of the site off? And, and he explained that, you know, he had uh, diabetes, he was in a high vulnerability group, and he certainly wouldn't be visiting the site, and that they would do all the site assessments via um, photographs. So he said, if you can send me photographs of the trench, the footing, the depth of footing, pictures of the insulation, the damp proof course, and so on. And that's what got me thinking, really, is that there must be uh, a better way of delivering our um, regulatory advice and the enforcement element to some of these higher risk premises rather than just looking at fire risk assessment as a desktop review. And I suppose that's when I thought, you know, could we look at um, images in the same vein that the building control officer had, or was there a better solution? And that's when I had the idea of remote video inspections. So in essence, doing exactly what we're doing now. So the inspector would be sat somewhere safe in the confines of uh, their office or their home location. And the responsible person or the manager of the premises that we would be inspecting could undertake a Teams or a WhatsApp video call and effectively walk that uh, inspector around the, uh, their premises. So initially, there was a few challenges that I thought that we really needed to overcome. The first was, can we legally do this? You know, have we got a legal basis because it deviates so significantly from 
what we normally do as a, as a fire and rescue service and what we do normally do as a, an enforcement body. So we sought advice from our um, barrister who provides um, legal guidance to us on um, the way that we approach the discharge of the regulatory reform order. And he was quite satisfied that that wouldn't be a, a problem, that it hadn't been done before. But in terms of delivering, um, d delivering our, uh, our remit, that was one of the areas covered that I thought might present a little bit of a challenge. So the next thing was an ICT solution. Uh, and I wanted to try and make this as accessible as I possibly could. So I wanted to give the managers or the responsible persons of the premises that we were visiting uh, a range of options because within our service, we use Microsoft Teams as a platform, but tonight's a great example. You know, we're on Zoom, everybody uses something slightly different. So I was hoping that we could offer WhatsApp, Teams, Zoom, Messenger, whatever people wanted to use as a, as a video platform. Uh, however, I was advised by our head of ICT that that wouldn't fit in with our internal ICT protocols, but the Teams is freely accessible to everybody. You don't need to have a Teams app or be subscribed to Teams in order for it to work, and that actually proved to be the case. We then spoke to our GDPR officer in terms of were there any challenges or reasons why we couldn't undertake these video uh, audits. Uh, and it was determined that because it was in the commercial sector that there certainly wouldn't be any issue with um, GDPR. We undertook a privacy impact assessment of the proposal. Uh, and the last one was, is this actually going to work? You know, it's, it's, it, it sounds pretty straightforward. We were all having Teams conversations with friends and family and Teams quizzes or Zoom quizzes at that time. So why wouldn't it work in a, in a more commercial setting? So we undertook a number of trials internally and with, uh, I suppose, trusted partners. So some of those commercial sector organizations that we'd worked very closely with, and we were relatively confident that they'd be happy to trial this. And we did that in a healthcare setting and in a couple of residential care homes, just to prove that the, the concept worked. So I suppose the next slide sort of um, highlights how it works. And, and, and it really is as, as, as simple as I uh, mentioned earlier on, the concept itself. So you've got your um, fire service inspector in an office based setting working off a laptop as many of us are tonight. And then the through teams uh, connectivity is created to the responsible person or the manager of a care home or other premises. And then they have a choice of using a smartphone or a tablet or anything this video enabled where they can effectively flip the camera around. So I'm seeing or the inspector is seeing what they are seeing. Um, before the audit takes place, there was a, a suite of documents that we produced, electronic documents explaining the process and a, a video link to a demonstration of what they could expect um, during the audit. There was also a requirement in, term, in, in terms of keeping the audit as short as possible. There was a requirement for the responsible person or the managers to send copies of their fire risk assessment, fire log books, training records, employer's liability uh, certificate, all the sort of stuff that we'd normally look for in a face-to-face. -face. So they'd send copies of that so that the desktop element could be done in advance. Uh, and then during the audit itself, it'd be kept as short as possible. The other thing that we found with having building plans sent to us electronically in advance is that we only really sample uh, elements of a premises for um, regulatory purposes. So, for example, we don't check that the door closer on every door in the building works. We'll just try a few. Um, and so having the plans in advance meant that we could concentrate on areas of interest. So where there were boiler rooms or where there were critical means of escape, we could ask the responsible person to video walk us there. And we'd only look at those areas that we th thought would be of greatest interest. Um, during the um, audit itself, the responsible person was um, talked through uh, the, you know, where we, where we wanted them to uh, take us. And you know, one of the big elements there in terms of controlling was the safety element. So we had to reiterate on quite a number of occasions, you know, during the RVIs, the remote video inspections, that we didn't want people walking whilst looking at their cameras. So it was, you know, a case of put your camera down and walk us to the boiler room. Okay, if you can show me the door, the boiler room, show me the detector in the ceiling, show me the smoke seals, and so on. So there was that element of the auditor or the inspector being in charge of that process and then finally an outcome so in, in the same vein as we would normally do with a face-to-face -face, uh, visit 
the outcome would either be a letter or uh, with a schedule of works where there were works uh, required or a broadly compliant letter. And the one thing that we did decide quite early on was that if the inspector saw something that gave cause for concern that may result in an enforcement action being undertaken, we'd stop the remote video inspection at that stage. And that would be the risk assessment or the justification, if you like, for going to do a face to face visit uh, to have a better understanding of what we thought we'd seen in the video um, inspection. So some of the immediate benefits that this resulted in was uh, quite clearly accessibility to premises during the pandemic. So some of those places that we thought we would be months and months before we could get back into, so healthcare settings, uh, care homes and so on, we were able to access those immediately. And certainly one of the peripheral benefits was that uh, it provided a, a real degree of reassurance to the responsible persons that they'd maintain standards because you know by now we're uh, 12 months that had elapsed at least since they'd had last had any face-to-face -face engagement with the business fire safety department so it certainly reassured them in most cases that the way that they were approaching fire safety uh, within their premises was still aligned to expectations it reduced immediate risk so in some cases during the audits we did uh, identify um, things that needed uh, immediate attention. So, for example, you would be aware that you know we were the uh, in terms of reducing COVID risk, there was um, uh, a drive to have more ventilation. So we found that people were wedging fire doors open, so we could you know explain why the fire doors were critical to that specific area and provide alternative solutions so that ventilation could be maintained, but without the uh, the inherent risk that, that was creating. Um, I suppose as well then it reduced the future backlog of audits. So that was one of the things, the areas of concern. I spoke earlier that we've got 36,000 premises and just 35 inspectors. So the longer that uh, gap or the hiatus of inspecting was going on, the, the longer and greater the backlog would have been in the future. And then some other um, benefits, I suppose, were that it reduced road risk. So normally people will, our inspectors will drive to the audit. So there's a, a degree of reducing road risk and travel there. Increased efficiency, of course, through the reduced travel time, the reduced road risk and, uh, and the utilization of existing technology. So in terms of the future opportunities, uh, and these are some of the things actually that we're starting to explore now. So we're looking at ut utilizing the remote video inspection as a mentoring platform, so that where a, a relatively newly qualified auditor is undertaking a remote video inspector, they can be mentored and monitored um, by a third party inspector, you know, looking from somewhere else. We use it as a quality assurance tool. So we have a quality assurance process within the service. But going back to the size of the service, you know, those 35 auditors or inspectors are, are spread out between a, you know, a huge area, um, which often involves a lot of tr travel to go and undertake some of these quality assurance uh, visits. So this, again, um, provided some uh, peripheral benefits there. We, uh, with uh, consent of the responsible person, we will sometimes record these visits and use them as a training resource uh, within our training days. And we are starting to look at collaborative inspection opportunities with other agencies. So quite often we will visit, for example, high rise residential buildings with uh, the housing agencies um, or maybe care premises with the care inspectorate Wales. So there are opportunities to do collaborative inspections over um, this video platform. Something that we haven't done yet, and there's some new legislation arising as the result of the Grenfell Tower recommendations, which will be the fire safety regulations. Uh, and that will bring in to scope the external envelope or cladding on high rise buildings. Now, the ultimate duty will be upon the responsible persons to demonstrate that their cladding fulfills the, uh, the required criteria. But there is an opportunity using um, fire service drones that we have. So we use them for operational purposes to um, stream the footage to be able to inspect and audit certain elements of high rise bil bil um, buildings. And then the last one there is that we have a peer review process so that's I suppose is our external quality assurance process uh, we have a peer review process across the vast so we are using the remote video assessment of um, premises
So in terms of uh, some of the challenges that we found with regards to the remote video inspection and some of the progress we've made to date, some of these challenges were to be expected. I think that connectivity, uh, ICT connectivity is always uh, a likely challenge and we certainly found that in some of the buildings, you know, quite often in some of the older buildings, some of the residential care premises, as they would uh, navigate or traverse around the building, the signal would occasionally drop out. Um, and I suppose in terms of the our inspectors or auditors themselves, some took on board this new concept very quickly and were champions of the process. And some people have taken a little bit longer to, to, to get on board with what is effectively a, a very different way of auditing premises. And I suppose the one that we weren't expecting is the one at the top there, motion sickness. So we did find that one or two of our auditors, because they were staring at the screen and you can imagine the responsible person is walking around holding a camera, it's, the motion is more akin to a sailing boat than, uh, than a car perhaps. Uh, and, and bizarrely, uh, although understandably, that did cause a degree of motion sickness in some individuals. So of course they're unable to um, continue with, with undertaking those audits. So the, the feedback that we've had from business owners has been uh, exceptionally uh, positive uh, in so much as I think they enjoy the, uh, the opportunity to provide the information up front. And obviously then that reduces the time that they have to take out of their uh, day to um, support and facilitate a visit. Um, initially utilised to engage primarily with care premises and that was the one area really that we we're really sort of scratching our heads in terms of you know how soon can we get back into these higher risk uh, occupancies um, and it's currently utilized for follow-on inspections as well so sometimes we'll go to a premises give them a schedule of works uh, and ask that they are completed within 28 days or three months whatever the the term might be and historically we've gone back out to those follow-on visits just to make sure that a small piece of work has been done whereas now we can verify and tick that off effectively by use of uh, a video conference through the remote video inspection and a couple of things at the bottom there the the concept has been nominated for the fire fire emergency awards which are upcoming in december uh, and i think we are still the only fire and rescue service in the uk to adopt the approach Although, as I'm sure you can imagine, there are quite a few who have approached us to uh, ask more questions and to understand how it is working in Mid and West Wales. So I think, Seamus, that's, uh, that's the end of the, the sort of short presentation on remote video inspections. I have got one uh, final slide on um, our consultation that's ongoing, which has got a link to the consultation, but a bit of a shameless plug there, but I'll do that after questions if that's okay. I wouldn't expect any more, Sean. You know, <laughs> send that definitely, and you know, always willing to do this kind of thing. It's, it's important. Great. You have to stop sharing there, Sean, please. I think it's double up there. Cool. Okay. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just looking at the chat room, see if there's anything in the chat room. Uh, nothing in there at the moment, but question from me, Sean. Just, just thinking, you know, maybe you've already looked at this. Um, when members of the public or an individual phones in going forward with um, where they've got a complaint about a hotel or somewhere they've stayed or something they've seen, do you think in the future, you, you know, if they're still on scene, you'll be able to use this as a process of them actually showing you what they're looking at? Quite possibly. And this is something that we've talked about. So um, I'm not sure if any of the uh, participants tonight are aware of um, 999i. So that's a, a tool that some emergency services already use so that if members of the public are at the scene of an incident, as well as calling 999, they can stream images of that incident to our control room. Um, so that can be shared with um, tactical responders to give them a better idea of what they're going to be doing. So, so yes, ab absolutely. Um, th there's certainly opportunities in the future for, um, for that to be streamed, perhaps. Um, again, that's just a step forward from what we currently receive. So 99% of the complaints that we currently receive will be uh, via email and generally augmented then with some images of, uh, of, um, of whatever the... the perceived fire safety deficiency would be. Right, okay. Uh, question in the quite chat room here from Simon. How, how do you deal with reception black spots? Yeah, th thanks for Simon for that. Um, <laughs> I think 
that that's one of the you know the, the 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 weak points with this, I suppose, or I suppose with any sort of use of video telephony, um, where we had instances where signal would cut out, we would simply you know make arrangements to catch up with those individuals as a face to face. Uh, there was very little that we could do in in those cases. Okay, brilliant. Um, Katie's put a one in, a, a good question in the um, chat. You know, uh, where there are instances where you could have used remote auditing, for instance, in intrinsically safe workplaces where telephones are not able to be used. So generally, Katie, the the premises that we attend, I'm trying to think if there would be anywhere. I suppose some some of the hospital uh, operating theatres, perhaps that would relate to, but we haven't tested it there. They're not generally areas that we would um, we would audit, um, because of the, the the close regulatory supervision that those premises has anyway. And then the other things that jumps to mind, I suppose, is the coma sites. But then we don't audit the operational areas of coma sites because they are um, they're regulated by a separate competent authority so I'm, I'm really trying to rack my brains here and think about an instance where normal phones we that we couldn't use which is within our operating scope and, and I don't think that um, that there is anywhere uh, I wasn't I was trying to think as well Simon when you when the question well myself it's a good question I want to have a look at because it may happen in the future uh, one here from Mike Hill have you needed to give much training to those using the cameras on site? I know you've uh, alluded it to your presentation because uh, he started something similar, uh, but with the operators having no idea what to what's required and uh, sometimes not a single frame is clear. Well, no, we haven't. I mean, the the idea of the concept was along the lines of that we're all used to this technology we'd, we'd all been using zoom teams and so on in our um day-to-day -day social lives you know to yeah. communicate with families um and it's there definitely needs to be a level of buy-in from the uh, managers or the responsible persons of the premises that are easy reasons to say well you know i can't do that i'm not familiar with the technology i haven't I, I don't understand how the software works or there are signal black spots we haven't got the reception but for, for us certainly where we have had um willing uh, participants and they they've all been i was going to say the majority and that wouldn't be true they, they've all been willing and engaging there certainly haven't been any issues with um operator error i suppose Oh, that's good. You know. It's a learning process for a lot of people. I, I totally understand that. Uh, one here from Nicholas Jones. How does the remote audit compare in terms of time taken to undertake the audit, uh, excluding travel? So the the remote audit itself, there's there's not a huge amount of time saving because there's the the time it takes to um, to make contact with the responsible persons initially to explain to them what the remote video inspection process will involve. Um, there's the desktop review of paperwork uh, plans uh, and so on that are sent in and then there's obviously the mop-up time that we normally do in terms of issuing letters mm -hmm. but i think you know you talk about excluding travel times there and i think there's therein are the two key elements here is you do save on the travel time plus the peripheral benefits of reducing road risk uh, and also you you are not exposing the occupants of that premises to any transmission risk either you know whichever way that is from the auditor to the residents or from the residents the other way um okay there's, there's a few things there with you which benefit as well uh one here from michelle um, I had a telephone audit from Cheshire Fire and Rescue at the university, just making a point there that, they, that they've had telephone audits. Don't know how that works, but I suppose we're all looking at different ways of actually doing this. Don't know whether Michelle wants to you know, take that uh, embellish on that, how it went. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I'd be keen to know, Michelle, was that uh, an audio only um, or, or was it a uh a video audit using uh, using a smartphone and and the reason i ask is you know i've given this update of this presentation at um, quite a few for us so our national body the national fire chiefs council is one that heads of protection or fire safety from all across the country will attend uh, and there's there's been a lot of interest in in the concept you know the questions always come up about yeah. have we got a legal basis to do it what about gdpr some of the things i spoke about um and it, it would be great if somebody else has sort of uh, you know taken taken this sort of concept up as well yeah it'll be very interesting that would be see what, what they're doing is it just telephone uh, another one here so i'm not going to try to pronounce the name i'll make a mistake in front i think that's how you pronounce it uh, will you be keeping this uh, method going forward 
So that, yeah, that's a really good question. So we are now back in the realms of auditing all types of premises. So we've got our COVID safe measures in place. You know, we've got our auditors uh, um, double jab. They've got their vaccine passports and, and so on, even though that's not mandated. He's frozen. Has it frozen? It looks like it to me. Yes. There's a don't know if you can ever can anybody else hear me. It looks like it has frozen. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. It's just Sean. It seems to be frozen. It must be something his end. Yeah, we can hear you, Seamus. Sounds like it's yeah, Sean's it's connection. Let's see. left as I can't see him. Oh, looks like he's dropped out of the call. Okay, we'll see if he can, if he can rejoin us. Looks like he has definitely frozen out somewhere. Something's happened, uh, which not nothing, nothing unusual. I hate to say, if, you know, we're all used to this could happen on these calls. Some, you know, even presenter, you know, I've lost uh, connection myself. I remember what, I went back there, a team member, this back in June, uh, somebody decided to cut through a power cable in my house. <laughs> I lost everything. Uh, I'll just give Sean a couple of minutes to see if he rejoins. Not getting any at the moment. Okay. Right. Um, while I'm waiting up there, if I can ask if anybody's got any other further questions, you know, please don't hesitate to put them onto the West Wales branch webpage uh, or Twitter account, and we'll pick them up and I'll pass them on to Sean. Uh, you've seen Sean's uh, uh, email address there. You know, we're going to put the presentation on the IOSH um, website. Uh, so it's there for anybody to link into and ask Sean any questions you will. will, because Sean will, you know, uh, answer any questions that people have got. He's you know, really good. He'll have no problem doing that to you. Um, so it looks like he's not uh, joining us. Uh, thank you for that, Katie. As, you know, I thought it was a really good presentation and really, you know, thought provoking as well with regard to the future going forward. You know, that this technology is really a good thing for us all. Um, to use, you know, list by looking at it in different ways. It's not just about meetings like this. What else it can do for us? Uh, so that, that's a good thing. I said it looks like uh, Sean not going to be able to rejoin us there. So what I'll do, I'll say thank you to everybody there. That I will uh, catch up with Sean tomorrow and update him. Um, all I can say to everybody, if you would, you know, look at the presentation and pick up Sean's email address and send him any queries and do undertake his survey. Can I thank you all for joining the West Wales branch tonight and keep an eye on our web page because we are doing a lot more presentations. We've got some good presentations coming up later this year and early next year. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all coming again. So I'd like to thank you all for this evening. Uh, stay safe and look after yourselves. Thank you. Thank you.